Here's an interesting comment from Tamler, where he starts to question whether Scott is even playing the same language game as Sam, whether he's actually engaged in an authentic argumentative dialogue at all. The Scott Adams interview, it's a it's a it's it's a funny thing to listen to. You get kind of disoriented and 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 there was a kind of postmodern feel to it. There was a kind of postmodern critical theory kind of perspective that he seemed to be inhabiting with facts and 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 reason-based arguments or at least sort of you know objective reason-based arguments that could be independently evaluated just didn't play the role for him that it play that it plays for you and that it's you know mostly we think plays for for all of us and there was a meta level as trying to, when you know when you two would debate say the russia investigation or climate change and he would say well you know the paris deal was a hoax and you weren't but trump said climate science was a hoax and you know all of a sudden they're, they we're shifting terrain and then you start to wonder is scott adams treating this very debate as something to be like a, a vehicle for persuasion not of you. He probably knew that you weren't going to be persuaded. But so he's not trying to win the argument in the or the debate in the sense that we understand that. He's trying to do what he says Trump is a master at doing, which is persuade people to appreciate Trump or to find something in him that they haven't found before. And then it was like, now I don't it's like how do you assess this uh this argument at all, if he's not even trying to win the argument, as I understand winning arguments, you know? No, I think that's true. I think he's very sincere about his insincerity. I think he's got, he's got this bad faith structure to his game, and he's fine with that. And I feel that there is an immense number of, of intellectual and ethical problems that follow from that. That bad faith structure to Scott's game that Sam is talking about is one way that a philosopher might characterize a sophist, a person who they thought was only concerned with persuasion and defending a position using any rhetorical tool at their disposal, and who didn't believe that facts and reason matter in persuasion. If you're talking to someone who believes this, it's reasonable to ask, how are you supposed to interpret what they're saying to you right now? How can you have an authentic, rational dialogue with such a person? This is the worry that Tamler is expressing, that this position, if a person actually holds it, undermines the very possibility of a certain kind of rational communication. Now, I think this is really Scott's biggest challenge when he's trying to dialogue with people across the aisle. Not the political aisle. I'm not talking about Scott as a Trump supporter trying to persuade a Trump critic. I mean, when he's trying to persuade philosophers in the broad sense in which I would characterize Sam and David and Tamler as philosophers, namely as someone who believes the world has an objective structure, that this structure is something we can learn about, that we can have knowledge of, someone who believes that people can be motivated by reasons and argumentation, and that it's important to support cultural practices and institutions that reinforce these beliefs, which seem to be fundamental to not only a scientific worldview, but any worldview consistent with Enlightenment ideals. Scott's problem is that he's made it easy for people to think that he, Scott, does not share these beliefs, that he really is an amoral sophist, a cynic, a relativist, whose only concern is playing the game of persuasion and manipulation. This is the most common objection I hear from Scott's critics on social media, and you hear it here from Sam and David and Tamler. The perception is real, it's genuine. Now, I personally don't think this is a fair description of Scott. I think it's an extreme characterization. I think it's way too reductive. I don't think Scott thinks of himself this way, and I don't think he wants to be perceived this way. But like I said, he has made it easy for people to see him this way. The reality is that there's a spectrum of views that range from the idealized philosopher on one end the rationalist, the truth seeker, the person motivated by logic and reason and evidence, to the idealized sophist on the other end, the irrationalist, the relativist, the amoralist, the cynic, who is only interested 
and persuasion and manipulation. Real people are some combination of these orientations. Now, it's clear that if you had to locate Sam and Scott on the spectrum, you'd put Sam closer to the philosopher end and Scott closer to the sophist end, but not at the extremes. Sam's not naive about human psychology and the limits of reason, and he's clearly interested in being an effective communicator and persuader. And Scott does think that he's latching on to objectively true features of the world and of human nature. And it's clear that he is motivated by reasons and wants to persuade people with reasons and arguments, despite what he says about the ineffectiveness of facts and reason in politics. Scott, if you're listening, you do need to rethink this talking point. You must see the problem with saying over and over that facts and logic never change minds while you are simultaneously presenting facts and logic in an effort to change people's minds. This is the only way to make sense of what you're doing on your blog posts and your Periscope lectures. Here's a clip from Scott. So while it's true that lying is unethical, you've just seen somebody tell whopper after whopper they had this weird quality that if people sort of were influenced by them, it made the world a better place. It's the weirdest thing. So when people say to me, Sam Harris, I'm talking to you, uh, why don't you talk about the ethical dimension? And I think it's a fair question, but I wanted to process it for a while and, and do it right. Because I'm not your pope, right? I'm not the guy who wants to tell you what you should think. But I wanted to be the guy who helped you frame it. In other words, gave you a framework for looking at it that might be different from the one you were using. Compare it to the way you were thinking. It doesn't need to change your mind, but it gives you a different window into it, right? Scott says, I wanted to process it for a while and do it right. What is it you're trying to do right? You're trying to give a rationally compelling defense of your position on Trump. And you're even trying to make your position accountable to the facts vulnerable to refutation. So here's what I'll ask. What you just saw, if you watched it from the beginning, was pretty provocative. Whatever you thought of it, it was provocative. I want you to, I want you to digest it a little bit and then keep me honest, all right? If you see an example going forward, you don't do a deep dive into the past because there'll be plenty of material that's more fun and current in the future. Just watch anything he does that seems to be inaccurate. And then, except for, don't count the stuff where they intentionally misinterpret his, his statements, because that, that stuff is transparent. But the things where just his fact is wrong. And then ask yourself, is it directionally in the society that, that we would want to move anyway? You know, is that a coincidence? Um, and if you see any violation of that, you should certainly call that out. You know, if there's anything he says that's factually incorrect and also causes a real world problem or even a potential bias in the wrong direction, call it out. Let me know. This isn't what a person would say if they really believed that facts and logic make no difference to people's judgments. So the philosopher's sophist spectrum is a matter of degree, a continuum. Scott has an orientation farther toward the sophist end of the spectrum, but he's not the stereotype of the pure sophist, any more than Sam Harris is the stereotype of the pure rationalist, the pure philosopher. But here's the communication problem. The problem is that when these philosophical orientations become entangled with people's political and cultural and moral identities, as they do in this case, they're no longer free-floating. They're vulnerable to the forces of tribal thinking and they trigger the same mechanisms that generate the in-group, out-group polarization that Scott talks about so often. Confirmation bias takes over, and all we see is the stereotype we're carrying around in our heads. Now, from my standpoint, the irony for Scott is that the sophist stereotype that he's vulnerable to is one that shares a space with other forms of postmodern anti-rationalism. It puts him in company with elements of the anti-democratic, anti-modernist nationalists of the far right and the radical feminists and neo-Marxists of the far left, which I find kind of hilarious given Scott's anti-PC stance, his liberal and libertarian leanings, and his enthusiasm for modern science and technology. 
These are not the bedfellows he wants. But if he keeps pushing the line he's pushing in the way he's pushing it, I predict that this is the stereotype that he'll constantly be fighting. He'll be seen by people closer to the philosopher's end of the spectrum, which is really the majority of educated people, frankly, liberals and conservatives. He'll be seen as situated at the other end of the spectrum, as an amoral, anti-reason, anti-science, anti-democracy sophist. This is the hallucination, as he might say, that he'll constantly be trying to dispel.